Hey, this is Matt Williamson with another episode of Pop Goes the 60s. I wanted to take a little time to talk about the Rolling Stones top 500 albums list that came out in 2020, this fall, and um, just give you some of the reactions that I have over reactions of others. Uh, first of all, the circles that I usually mix in are, you know, the classic rock circles, the old stuff. That's why I had this channel called Pop Goes the 60s. So the prevailing opinion of those people my age and older, the baby boomers, where some people were aghast at this list, particularly Beatle fans who saw Sgt. Pepper drop from the number one position in their 2003 list to 24 on the 2020 list. The original list back in 2003 had four Beatle albums in the top 10. And um, the only one in the top 10 now is Abbey Road. And some Beatle fans found that, I guess, they were objected to that. Um, the list that we know today was compiled by a lot, of, a lot more younger people. Rolling Stone was trying to include more young performers that voted on this list. And it, the results clearly show that. Uh, I think Rolling Stone is trying to obviously be relevant and trying to to talk about newer albums and there seems to be a, just a big chasm between 21st century and 20th century music. And when you combine the two together, it's like oil and water, you know? So just a couple observations I have, I wanna make from the list. Uh, there was also some talk, people felt it was, this, the 2020 list was very politically correct. Uh, I would say yes and no. First of all, you've got a lot of new rap acts entering the top 50 here. And let me just read off a few of them. And some of these aren't that new, by the way. So not, the highest one, Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, 1988. That one's at number 15. Kanye West at 17 with My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. That's already 2010. Kendrick Lamar, To Pimp a Butterfly, 2015. Notorious B.I.G., Ready to Die. Wu-Tang Clan, Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, that's from 1993. D'Angelo with Voodoo, 2000. Beyonce coming in at number 32 with Lemonade, which was 2016. Dr. Dre, Jay-Z at number 50. So you can see some, uh, so the, some of the newer or the rap acts getting into the top 50. But what happened was that just displaced a bunch of black acts that were on the 20. 03 list. Here's who disappeared. Chuck Berry, gone. Robert Johnson, gone. James Brown, gone. Muddy Waters, gone. John Coltrane and Little Richard all dropped out of the top 50. Uh, Miles Davis, who at kind of, with Kind of Blue was at number 12, has dropped to 31. And Bob Marley and the Whalers legend dropped from 46 to 48, so a little drop there. So really, it's not, um, I thought that was interesting. It's, you know, you talk about somebody like Robert Johnson, would, would there ever, ever have been rock music without his playing? I mean, maybe not, don't know. One of the things that I noticed about this list, um, the people with, who notice some political correctness here, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, we've got Marvin Gaye at the number one spot with what's going on. I don't know that that's that controversial of a pick. I don't, you know, had this list come out in January of 2020, I think Rolling Stone would probably, it would be more credible. Obviously, beginning of the year till now, a lot of things have happened in the country that makes what's going on a relevant album, certainly today. Would it have come in at number one in January? I don't know. Here's, here, let me run down the top ten here. Some of these are a little bit... They could use some discussion, perhaps. So number two, we've got the Beach Boys with Pet Sounds. This album has got a wonderful reputation. Um, but I, I, I don't know. Number two, that may be kind of high. I mean, it's more of a... The Brian Wilson orchestration and the symphonic stuff that he did here and with Smile, I think it's a little more elitist type of listening. Does that garner a number two position? I don't know. Number three, of have Joni Mitchell with Blue. You know, does this garner the third spot? I mean, this is this album is considered her finest. I mean, there's other albums you can argue are better that are more, far more um, 
there's a greater variety of music on other of her albums. This is purely a confessional album. It's not unlike a lot of her other albums, but it's rather one-dimensional. And for number three, I think that's maybe a reach. The next three, we've got Stevie Wonder's songs in the Key of Life, The Beatles' Abbey Road, Nirvana, Nevermind. All super huge rock albums that I don't think people would have much of a, a argument of those being in the top ten. Though the next one, Fleetwood Mac at number seven with Rumors, that one jumped up from 26. So that one seems to be gaining momentum, and for whatever reason, I guess the younger people rate that much higher than us old, older folks did back in 2003. That's a little surprising. Then at eight, we have Prince of the Revolution with Purple Rain, Bob Dylan, Blood on the Tracks, and in my opinion, the most controversial ranking, Lauren Hill with the Education of Lauren Hill at number 10. Now, I actually know that album. It's a good album. But it jumped up in 2003, it was at 314. And Lauren Hill has not done another album since, not a studio album. She's done one live album and has had a bunch of failed singles, like about 20. So that album came out in 1998. So she hasn't done much since then. So I'm wondering how in the world has she stayed relevant enough to affect that big of a jump from 2003 to 2020. I find that a little bit suspicious. I guess if you're gonna have a ranking just based on writers and performers, I guess the ranking's the ranking. But as I look at the 2003 list, we've got four Beatle albums in the top 10. I just think that's overrepresented by the Beatles. I just, as great as those albums are, a lot of others get pushed out. I mean, there's no Elvis in the top 10 in 2003. And by the way, Elvis dropped out of the top 50 completely in 2020. Um, so I, you know, I wonder if this list was purely just a, a ballot or was it engineered a little bit after the fact. Um, but I, I guess no matter how you look at it, I'm left with the feeling that there maybe should be two lists, you know, a 21st century list in a 20th century list, and maybe just a top 50 for each. It's really hard once you're dealing with album number 413 or whatever. A couple of people that didn't make it in the top 50, <clears throat> there's no Steely Dan. I think that's a bit of a crime. Um, the thing about Marvin, the Marvin Gaye album at number one, let's, What's Going On, which is 1971, his next charting album on the top 500 list in 2020 is at 422, and that's Let's Get It On from 1973. That album was actually a bigger hit than what's going on back in the 70s. So we've got Marvin Gaye with one album at the very top. His next album, his next two albums are at 422 and 493. If he's that good with one album, I mean, are these albums that much worse? I, that's a little bit odd. The other thing is these younger people may only know one or two albums by these old acts. They may not know their whole catalog. That's, I mean, that's a lot to take in. Hence, maybe we should have two different lists covering two different centuries. Well, that's my quick take here on Pop Goes the 60s. See you next time. Mm -hmm.